Hello gardeners, thank you so much for joining us for Mid-American Gardener. We're gonna learn a lot today, I'm pretty sure. We're hoping that we're gonna learn a lot. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. And so I'll handle perennial and cut flower questions, but there are three really talented, intelligent people next to me. So let's find out who they are and their expertise and you can gear your questions towards that. Let's start first with you, Chuck Voigt. Well, hi, Diane. I'm Chuck Voigt. Uh, I'm in crop sciences as well. Uh, I, I teach home horticulture, and my specialties are vegetables and herbs. And tonight, I brought leeks. I know, I know you, <clears throat> you have a past uh, Ooh, ah. association with leeks. <clears throat> I tell my students that uh, leeks are, are one of those things that they really ought to grow because they tend to be very expensive and hard to find mm -hmm. usually, and they're as easy to grow as onions, and, and they don't have that, that sulfurous nastiness that onions can have, at least for me. Um, so, so they're good. Uh, they're best when they're started uh, it, it, late winter, late January, early February, and then they're ready to go out in April. And uh, an interesting, interesting uh, way to plant them uh, because most people like the white shaft. Exactly. Uh, I, I take a bulb planter and go down six or even eight inches if the soil is cooperative. And you just, you just pop them out of here and you can see all the roots that thing has got. It's, you probably should tease those out a little bit at this point. Um, and <clears throat> it's interesting, uh, uh, an English garden blog said, just drop them, you know, shake off as much soil as you can, drop them into the bottom of that hole water them in so they come in contact with, with the soil that's down there, and then don't do any filling it at all. Just let it kind of happen you know, as it happens through the rest of the season. Because if you get dirt up over the bases of the leaves, uh, they can rot and, and you can have problems. Plus, they're, they're like little conduits. Dirt goes right down into the shaft once it gets on there. So that's why you're always cutting them and washing them before you use them. But um, that's a great way to do that. If, if, you, if you start them early, plant them in April, harvest them in late fall. I, 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 I've had them as thick as, as my wrist. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't want to go through all of that, you can direct seed them. They won't have long shafts, but they'll be young and tender, and, and you can eat them as baby leeks. And they are just so sweet, and they caramelize beautifully. There's almost a, 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 a fresh wonderful. green pea aftertaste mm -hmm. to them instead of that sulfurous bite that onions have. It, it's, it's, along with shallots, it's, it's probably my, those are probably my f two favorite alliums that, that are in the world. And because of being, working for the uh, folks in Switzerland, those are my two favorite also, because they would grow shallots and leeks. Pori. And I didn't know what I was growing, but it was sure good. So yeah. leeks, I like the idea of dropping it down in and letting it fill in just through natural. The watering. only problem, I, I've, I've, I'm doing it that way this year, and the only problem I've had is when you try to cultivate around them, the soil tends to want to jump in there. Yeah, that's and, true. And I worry about that. But they seem to be the, they got through the just water them in and don't put any soil over the, over the root ball at all. They got through that fine. So. Well, I may have to try that next year. And you have a whole flat of them, so we have them on the set because it looks great. Well, and horticultural. That, and and <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to share with the panel or the, Ooh, or the, ah. or the people behind the cameras as well. I see. Okay. Thank <laughs> you very much, Chuck. That's very interesting. Well, in the middle is Candace Miller. Hi, Candace. Hello. Uh, my name is Candace Miller. I am a, a horticulture educator for University of Illinois Extension. Uh, I work in a couple of counties up in the northwestern corner of Illinois. Uh, and I specialize a lot in kind of perennials, annuals, cut flowers, but really anything kind of home gardening I know a little bit about. So since it's peony season, uh, I thought I would bring some uh, peonies today to talk a little bit more about uh, those. Um, we get questions a lot of times about the ants, of course, that, that come to peonies. Um, a lot of people believe the myth that the peonies are there to help open the flower, which of course they're not. Uh, the peonies are just there for the nectar. Uh, that's on the peony butt. So if you see ants on your peonies, no need to worry at all. They're just there for the nectar. They're not there kind of forcing it open. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a myth. Um, so, that'd be impressive. I know, right? It, that would be cool if they did that, but they don't. Um, 
So uh, uh, being a florist as well as um, as Diane is, um, I like to bring them in as cut flowers, of course. So if you want to do that and avoid the ants, just bring them in, dip them underneath water, and the ants will uh, scatter away. Uh, and this is actually a great stage to do your cut peonies in. Once the uh, color starts to show and the bud starts to open like this, that's a perfect stage to cut. So you can bring those in, put them in a nice warm water, they'll, they'll pop open. Um, within a couple of days for you. And the ants wouldn't be on at that stage no. mm -mm. nearly nope, much. So. I remember one year we had, um, close in this county, we had the N International Peony Festival, the conference, mm -hmm. and the peonies flowered two weeks early. Oh. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And so all of the folks harvested peonies in that stage and wrapped them in. Yeah, moist, you can wrap um, them in newspaper, keep them in a cooler for, I've heard people say months, they've stored them like that, and then bring them out cut them fresh, put them in warm water. They had to store them for 10, 12 days, yeah. and they were beautiful. So people are afraid to do that, but yeah. you can't time your peonies always. Mm -mm. Now, you can't get them to flower earlier, no, <laughs> but you can hold them to flower <laughs> later. Good. Thank you very much. Always get a lot of questions about peonies, mm -hmm. especially this time of year. Okay, let's go next to you, Dyke Barkley. All right. My name's Dyke Barkley, and I um, run my own place, uh, Barkley Farms Nurseries down in Paris, kind of specialize in perennials and grasses and unusual plants, as well as uh, teach the horticulture program down at Lakeland College. What I brought today were some unusual plants. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, sweet potato vine, but this is actually true potato vine, which those two are unrelated. And uh, so they're an annual or a tropical. Um, what I like about them are just unusual foliage. I've had this one for several years. It's got kind of a golden edged foliage to it, little white blooms. I uh, like to use it, uh, particularly if you got like a, a annuals in a planter, like a blue pot, that, that chartreuse really pops against it. I got this one a couple of years ago, another species of potato vine, and it has white foliage, a little bit stiffer branches. And then next to me, I brought one of my older stock plants that's kind of covered with uh, blue flowers. So this one has white flowers the size of a dime. This one will have blue flowers anywhere from a nickel to a quarter. So it's kind of an interesting, unusual, uh, very carefree, uh, just let it do its own thing and, and getting kind of impressed with it that way. And it is potato vine. It is true potato vine. No, mm -hmm. no potatoes produced, but it is selenium, or selenium, uh, the potato. And not yeah. the sweet potato vine. Yeah. This is just gorgeous. Yeah, it's just, it's different than anything else I've seen, and that's kind of what I like about it. Different and it does look usual. nice with your black and blue salvia. salvia. Wow. Wow, that's pretty. I don't think he brought samples for the panel, <laughs> but, but I appreciate you bringing that because that is very unusual. Yeah. It's going to be fun to go visit your nursery. Okay. <laughs> well, now we want to go to the uh, phone lines next, and we're going to start with Susan. She's on line two and has a question about rhubarb. Hi, Susan. Hi, Diane. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, last fall, I transplanted some rhubarb. I brought it down from Kane County to Vermilion County. And it's come up this spring. I was real excited. It leafed out. But the stalks are only about three to four inches tall. <laughs> and they're not getting any bigger. So I was wondering what the problem was. Okay. Chuck, I'm looking at you or well, Candace. Or? I, I, I knew you would. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, first of all, after you uh, transplant it, you're not going to harvest the, the first year anyway. Oh. So... Um, it needs to get reestablished. You know, depending on how much root you were successful in digging up and how much you divided it and all those things, um, it, that, that could be problematic. It, it, it should reestablish and, and, and grow. Um, be sure that it's not in a situation where it gets too much water on it because uh, you know, all these fleshy root, rooted things uh, don't really appreciate being drowned. Um, but I think just see what happens um, as you go through this season. Hopefully, uh, you know, when we start to dry out, make sure it, it, it stays well watered and hopefully uh, keep that foliage on it as long as you can because they tend to die back a little bit in the, the heat of summer through this part of the world. Uh, but I wouldn't expect it to be just fantastic at this time. It's a little problematic that it's that it's that stunted, but uh, at, at least a year before you, before you harvest anything from it anyway. So uh, let it get established. If, if it continues to be a problem next year, then maybe there's a problem. But at this point, I don't think there's too much to worry about. 
It's just you want it right away, <laughs> and it doesn't. It's not a right away plant. For no, it's the it's quicker than asparagus. <laughs> oh, that's for sure. <coughs> so, which is looking beautiful, by the way. I've had this, some good asparagus. Yes. I've had a great week. I've had my first strawberries yesterday and today. Ooh. Turnips. We grilled them mm -hmm. yesterday. Ooh, that was really good. Cajun seasoning on the grill, and broccoli. So it's been a great week horticulturally. <laughs> All right. It sounds let's like culinarily. <laughs> yeah. Well, that too. That too. But you had to have them <coughs> to pick them. True. So. All right. Well, and they were all from our gardens. Now, let's go to Mike's question. He has a lawn question on line three. Hi there, Mike. Oh, good afternoon. Generally, I remember back in the 1950s reading about that people used to put white clover into lawn seed mixes and wouldn't... Is there anything like that that we should put into our lawns to help attract bees? Wow, I didn't even try <laughs> to put white clover in my yard. It just kind of comes But in. it is there. Okay, who yeah. wants to? Be, be, before the fertilizer industry took over, that's how you, <laughs> that's yeah. how you greened up the lawn, yeah. was, was, was having the, the white clover there to, to fix the nitrogen. Yeah, so I mean, if you can add it to a seed mix or add the seed yourself, definitely something you can add. Um, and then obviously there's lots of other weeds that you could just let go as well. I mean, dandelions are going to be great for bees as well. So I think just avoid, avoid eliminating the weeds and you should be attracting some bees more than likely. It mow fairly high yeah, that so as well. that you're not constantly mm -hmm. taking off the blossoms yeah. or the bees that are on the blossoms. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so it does somewhat come on its own, but you can custom make mm -hmm. a mix. And bees love dandelions, like you said, mm -hmm. and clover and lots of other wildflowers and yeah. weeds so i hate to mention question. it but they love they love uh, creeping charlie too oh, that's <laughs> well <good>. yeah <laughs> which is not a good thing or hand it, it would be uh, you have to <laughs> pick the uh flower slash lawn that you want <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to not really notice what your neighbors are doing or care what they think about your yard <laughs> there's that so but i think the white clover is attractive I think so. So. I but i don't the, the smell is wonderful it is yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, I really don't care. I guess what <laughs> folks think because it's it's if it's green, it's good. It's green and <laughs> it does green up nice. So thank you for that question, Mike. That was a good one. Let's go to Al's question on Iris. Let's uh, hit line four. Hi there, Al. Hi. I stumped you last year. I had my iris all came out white. Uh oh. I called, I called <laughs> and said, "What can I expect this year? White or, or purple?" What happened? Uh, well. The very first ones came out white for, for about three or four days, and then after that, everything was bright purple. So I said, at least they came out real good. I was very happy with them. So was yeah. it from the same exact area that they were all white last yeah. year? Well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Same, same plantings and everything. Well, you, we get this sometimes with tulips mm -hmm. and with iris, and it really shouldn't changed does anyone yeah. <laughs> I we were stumped because yeah. we couldn't understand why it would happen and I think we still are yeah. yes I think we might still be <laughs> unless you know just the white ones came up in and around and yeah. they were a mix I don't know it, yeah. so Al we're going to continue to be um, <laughs> enjoy them yeah, yeah <laughs> surprised and glad that you have all your colors um, for the iris this year thank you for that comment <laughs> and let's go on then to Vicki and she has a pear tree question on line five hello Vicki uh, yes uh, I've got two uh, ornamental pear trees and last year they started looking pretty bad in the, the uh, leaves started dying and they fell off and then this year in the spring they came back and they looked really good but they're starting to look like they did last year again and what I can tell what I've read on it could be what they call a fire blight yeah. mm -hmm. that's we had a lot of that last year on a lot of different trees uh, is there do you know if there's anything you can do to save them or is it just better to take the trees down is it just the tips where you're getting the fire blight? Um, yeah, it's, well, I had a lot of dead branches this uh, spring, too, from, from last year where they fell off. But they come back real green and real pretty a couple weeks ago, but I'm noticing the, the ends of the uh, branches are starting to wilt looking, and then the, and some of them are falling off and the leaves okay. are dying. 
Well, I know the plant pathologist said a few <laughs> things last year, and you guys can, that they would cut them back farther than the dead with uh, sanitized shears. Make sure that you have your clippers or whatever really clean rubbing alcohol, whatever you had to do, and mm -hmm. you would cut farther back. Anyone else? That's, want to? Yeah, that's about it. At least six inches back from the, the dead area, you want to uh, prune that out, try to keep the tree as healthy as possible. Are these big um, trees? Are they smaller? Or how big are they? Oh, they're, they're pretty large. I oh, would imagine mm -hmm. they're probably 30 feet. Or oh, that'll wow. be difficult 40 then, yeah. feet. I think that's just a judgment when they get bad enough, yank them and yeah. hope you, but you don't want it to go to your other fruit trees or crab apples or anything. But Could a professional arborist use uh, antibiotic sprays on them? I don't know. I think they, you have to have a license to do that, yeah. but I think... They're I, available, I, but... Yeah, because I know orchardists do that on, mm -hmm. on pears. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so if, they're, if they're really dear to you, you might contact an orchardist and see how expensive it would be to to hit them with, a, with, a, with an antibiotic spray because it is a bacteria. And then you might <coughs> consider what Dyke has said. If, if it's not that deer, you're gonna, I think once it starts. Mm -hmm. It's I, hard to get ahead. It's, it's going tree to that keep big. spreading. Because once it's there, you always have the inoculum for the next year. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why they say cut it out back and do it right away. Yeah. But if it's a 30-foot tree, 30 30 tree, that, yeah. that you can't can do that. Yeah. Yeah. These were little street trees that had been planted and not that high. Well, uh, we're sorry to not give you great news on that, Vicki, but at least you have, you know what's available. Okay, let's go back to our panelists, and we'll start <coughs> back with you, Chuck. All right, <clears throat> we have a squash question. How late do you plant squash to avoid vine borer? We found, uh, she found three squash bugs in the house last week already. Whoa. Mm. Um, I think we, we've talked about this a little bit before. I know Phil has talked to me about it, Phil Nixon, the, the entomologist. Uh, the vine borer stops flying <clears throat> about the middle of July. So <clears throat> I don't know that they're going to take a plant that's just a, base, a little tiny seedling. So you could probably get by with late June or if you really, really want to avoid it about the 4th of July, because by the time they get up, hopefully the, uh, the vine borers have, have put it away for the season. Uh, squash bugs, you know, tend to overwinter in like piles of brush and piles of old lumber and those kinds of things as, as adults. Uh, so maybe clean that up or or just squish them. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. they're, they're a problem. Uh, probably if, if you can with squash bugs, uh, when you first see those egg, eggs laid on the leaves, just look closely. They're, they're just arrayed in, in a, you know, like, like a battalion. And just pick those off and get rid of them because if, the sooner you can, you can start cutting into the population the better because if you let them snowball uh, by fall they're just they're just destroying the, even the, whatever fruit does develop okay so thank you because we're already having to think about that <laughs> planning ahead okay candace okay um, i have a question here about amaryllis from linda she has a sister who's going to be sending her two amaryllis bulbs she's not certain how to replant or what kind of pots to use um, and not sure what the, kind of the growing periods are and when the resting time is. Um, so with amaryllis, we typically force these as a uh, holiday uh, bulbs. So usually we, uh, they flower for us around Christmas time. And then after that, once the plant is done flowering, you're gonna cut off the flower stalk and you're gonna leave the foliage uh, growing. So keep watering it, keep it in a, a sunny, bright location throughout the spring and the summer, and you can even put it outside for the summer, or some people even plant it in the ground um, for the summer. And then once fall come around, once the kind of freezing temperatures start, um, that's when you kind of stop watering, bring it inside, let the foliage dry down uh, naturally, uh, and then cut off that foliage once it has um, dried down. And then it needs about a six to eight week resting period in order to help initiate flowers again. So either you put it in a cool garage or a cool basement, just a dark uh, kind of cool location, and then bring it back out, water it, and then you should have a, a flower for you by holiday time. Uh, in terms of pots, they do tend to get rather top heavy. So if you could use a clay pot or maybe a heavier um, sized pot, that's probably gonna be more ideal. 
and then just your regular uh, nice soilless potting mix will work well. And you plant it with about a third of the bulb uh, showing above the soil level uh, and the rest um, below. And that's, a, that's about it. I've seen amaryllis break plastic pots. Yeah, I, so have I. <laughs> so <much> Chuck's. In <laughs> your greenhouse, <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> yes, my amaryllis yes, are tough. Yes, that are yours. <laughs> <laughs> Be proud or just know you maybe. Yeah. This year when I, was, when I was doing them for class, they <clears throat> from bulb to bloom was between five and six weeks. Mm. Uh, some, I've heard it longer than that. I was doing this second semester, which is a little later in the period, so maybe they were a little more eager to get going. Mm -hmm. but, Could be. Could be. But uh, certainly by, by six to eight weeks. So that's good. Be yeah. All right. Well, things. good. Because people have those questions, and you've got to know your timing. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Candace. Yep. Now, Dyke, you're <clears throat> next. All right. <clears throat> I've got a question here on uh, Lady Banks Rose, and I, I'm going to say right off the bat when you see this picture, you, this, this plant isn't winter hardy for us. And the, and the uh, the color, the, the question says they, they had this plant in Dallas, down in Dallas, Texas. But the real question is, can they bring it and grow it in a container on the deck and overwinter it by just covering the pot? And the answer is no. It, we don't have very good luck growing things in containers and keeping them year round. Growing things as an annual or something like that works. But the problem with containers on the deck is you get the freezing and thawing and that just kind of tears up plants. And that's going to tear up really tough, extremely cold tolerant plants. So taking a plant that's not winter hardy here and trying to grow in a container is not going to work unless you have a way to bring it inside. And even that's going to be tough in a, in a typical home situation. It's going to be too warm in the house. So to answer, to answer backwards and say taking a plant that isn't winter hardy here, you can treat it as an annual, but uh, trying to keep it through the winter isn't going to work very well for us. And it's, it's mainly that freezing and thawing. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. So, that was gorgeous. Yeah, wow. and somebody will say, well, it works for me. And if you get uh, something that grows in the container and makes it through the winter, then take it and run. It's just <laughs> if trying to, to do it on purpose, you're, you're going to have trouble repeating that, mm -hmm. that act. Well, and if it's borderline, um, <clears throat> doing something to, to mulch it and cover it and protect yeah. it in the ground would be more likely to succeed than in a container. Right. Where more it, isolation, right. yeah. Right. <clears throat> yes. Or even taking that container and burying that container in the garden, mm -hmm. or, or burying it some mulch or something would help that way. But I, Lady Banks Rose, you're not. That's right. That's it's not even way close. even. It will not ever From look Texas. like no. the Texas no. version. Okay, thank you for that. Let's go to a gooseberry question since we have some <coughs> folks who might know that, and it's on line six about gooseberry. Hi, line six. Hello. Yes, what's your question? Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I have uh, five or six big plants of gooseberries, and they are just loaded. But they, the size of the berries hasn't changed for two weeks. And I'm wondering if, I, if they're going to fill out more, or should I have done some trimming? Well, I... It seems a little early for them to have reached their full size, uh, so I think probably in future years you might want to do some renewal pruning. Um, you know, if you can figure out the age of the various canes, figure out a, a four or five year rotation, take out the oldest ones and they'll, they'll come back in and fill themselves up. It reinvigorates them to some degree. Uh, also, uh, at, at that time, you might also head back some of the longer shoots uh, just to, to try to concentrate their effort into the berries that are left. We have had a couple <clears throat> weeks of cool, alternating cool yeah. and hot, which might... But yeah, you, you'd expect the hot to push them forward mm -hmm. and the cool to slow them down, so I, I don't know. That's true. But it's hard to say. Yeah. yeah, I just I just planted a new one that I that I ordered. It, it's thornless, thank goodness, <laughs> <laughs> and it came with 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 two gooseberries on it, oh. which which are still there. A stupid deer came by and took off the top of it, <laughs> oh, but no. but or, or maybe a brilliant deer, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a smart one. Yeah. Well, I wanted to do the gooseberry question, so thank you for that. Let's go to a special mag quiz next. <laughs> Mm. 
Supplemental landscape watering should be done at what time of the year? A. Spring and summer. B. Spring, summer, and fall. C. Summer. D. All four seasons. D. All four seasons. Regular watering in the growing season is routine for most gardeners, but fall and winter watering often is forgotten. Uneven distribution of rainfall over the year usually means that one or two fall and winter waterings can prove more valuable for the survival and health of trees and shrubs than an extra summer watering. I hope we don't have to talk about watering too much <laughs> this uh, season. It seems like it comes and goes, but um, I think it's been so far a great spring, don't you think? It's been up and down with temperature, but hopefully we've gotten a good start. So um, thank you for all of your expertise. I appreciate all of the show and tell you brought and all your knowledge. And uh, thank you all for being here. And of course, our folks here as well. Have a great week gardening. <laughs>